scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 1, and verses 11 through 14. This is the text of the letter that Prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people that Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then, will you, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Good morning. Good morning. Today we wrap up a sermon series entitled Faith for Tough Times. We've been walking through the book of Jeremiah as we follow the Israelites, God's chosen people, through a very difficult, tough time in their life. And as we've been doing that, we've been kind of gleaning, gathering nuggets of wisdom that we can apply to our own lives and our own tough times to exercise our faith muscle. So today we wrap that up. So before we get started, let's pray. Oh, Father God, in the next several minutes, you have chosen me to reveal your word to the folks gathered in this place. And I am not worthy. So I just give it to you, Lord, and I ask you to fill me. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with the words that these people need to hear. We stand with Jeremiah, Lord, and we cry out to you that we need you. And we cry out that we are all in exile. Until you come again, we seek your face. I pray, Lord, that the words that you have placed upon my heart and the struggle I have had with this sermon, Lord, that the reason I've had such a struggle is because it's going to change somebody's life. And so, Lord, I surrender all I have to you. Work through me and touch these people that have gathered in this place. And we'll just give you all the glory, Lord, and we, and we will just lay down and let you take it. I trust in your guidance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the Old Testament times, there were three things that the people needed to survive. And that was land, and that was descendants, and that was the blessing of God on both things. The land needed to be fertile so they could eat. The descendants needed to be many so they could work the land. And all of that came from the blessing of God. In the 12th chapter of Genesis, God chooses Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I am going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to give you all the land that you can possibly imagine. I'm going to give you all the descendants that you possibly count, realizing that Abraham was a very old man at this point in time. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to be your God, and you are going to be my people, and I only ask one thing, obedience. Because you folks are going to be my chosen people. All the descendants, you are going to be my witnesses to the world. So I need you to be obedient. Because you are going to show the world what I look like. So, Abraham does just this. And it all works pretty good for a little while. As the descendants multiply, 
And as they begin to intermingle with the cultures around them, they start to adapt and adopt the other cultures ways of life, and they also start to trust in their gods instead of the one true God, Yahweh. And pretty soon, they start to argue amongst each other and amongst the cultures, and so they say, God, we want to judge. We can't handle all this arguing. Please give us a judge. All these other cultures have a judge. We want a judge. God says, you don't need a judge. Just turn back to me. I am the ultimate judge. And they cried out, no, we want a judge. We want to be like the people around us. So God gives them a judge. Guess what? He gives them many judges. Guess what? It doesn't work. It's a disaster. So the people then say, okay, we want a king. Give us a king. Other cultures around us have a king. We want a king. God says, no, I am your ultimate king. You don't need any more kings. They said, I want a king. We want a king. They cried out. So God gave them many kings. And guess what? As you heard Pastor Larry preach over the last several weeks, he had bridge up on the screen. He showed you there were good kings. Yes, there were good kings. And when there were good kings, that meant that they followed God, that they were obedient. But when there were bad kings, the scripture says they did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they were not blessed. Good kings, bad kings. Pretty soon, the influence of the culture changed the Israelites instead of the Israelites being the light to the culture around them. With every king that the Lord allowed these people to have, there was a prophet assigned to the king. That prophet was the mouthpiece of God telling them what to do. Jeremiah just happened to be what scripture calls the weeping prophet because he brought only bad news most of the time. You folks have got to get back to your end of the covenant made with your father Abraham. You folks have got to come back to me. You folks have got to be obedient because this is not going to last long because there's destruction coming. And we heard last week, Pastor Larry preached about last week, it's never too late to turn back, and that's what Jeremiah told the people, and he begged them, and he begged them, and what did they do? They didn't turn back. They felt the other way was better. And so finally, what happened? They were carried into exile, away from everything that they knew as home. And there they were. They had a whole lot of nothing. There's a psalm in our Bible. It's Psalm 137. We're going to look at Psalm 137, and we're going to get a feel for the way that the Israelites felt in the midst of this destruction and in the midst of being in exile. Let's have this. This is Psalm 137, and I chose the message version because it kind of says it without pulling any punches. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks. We cried and we cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplay harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking, sing us a happy Zion song. Oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this wasteland? If I ever forgot you, Jerusalem, let my fingers wither and fall off like leaves. Let my tongue swell and turn black if I fail to remember you. If I fail, oh dear Jerusalem, to honor you as my greatest. These are the words of the people in exile. They had chosen not to be obedient. 
They had chosen to follow the ways of the culture around them and to follow other gods and had been carried away and had a whole lot of nothing. Jeremiah writes a letter to these exiled Israelites. And this is where we enter our scripture that was read to us today. This is a letter that Jeremiah wrote to the Israelites. He did it for two reasons. There were false prophets in those days telling these Israelite people, it's okay that you're here because it's not going to last very long. So just kind of hang out. Be in a limbo. It's not going to last long. Everything's going to be okay. So they did nothing. Jeremiah writes a letter to be read to the Israelites that says two things. It's good news and it's bad news. Okay, the good news is they are told that the Lord God will deliver them. Okay, that's good news, right? Bad news is it's not going to be when the false prophets say it's going to be in 70 years. Jeremiah writes a letter and gives instructions to these Israelites. This is what you do while you're in exile. So let's enter into this letter and let's look at it and see the instructions that Jeremiah gave to the Israelites. Let's look at this. Jeremiah 29.1 This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people King Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Next screen. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 5. The, now here's the instructions of what they're supposed to do. Not to be in limbo, but to build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, and here's the kicker. It, go, it asks these Israelites to go above and beyond. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. They don't want to be there in the first place. But now they're asked to put down roots, to marry. And now God is asking them, the prophet Jeremiah, to do what? Pray. Seek the prosperity and peace of the city. Pray to the Lord for it. Why? What's it say? Read it together. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The Israelites are asked to pray for the exiled city in which they are in. Let's go to the next screen. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. And here comes the bad news part. Because they're probably all thinking, okay, we can do this for a little while. I can do just about anything for a little while. But here comes the kicker. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. The next several verses are some promises that the Lord says he's going to do. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then, notice the little word there, then. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You'll seek me and you'll find me 
when you seek me with what? All your heart. It doesn't say some, and it certainly doesn't say when I feel like it, right? It says to seek the Lord with all your heart. The Lord is reaching out to his chosen people and simply saying, come back. Just come back. It's going to be okay. Don't just sit in limbo. It's going to be all right. Jeremiah 14. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord. I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This letter that Jeremiah sent to these exiled Israelites, these exiled chosen people, was a letter of hope for the hopeless. It was the one little piece, little nugget of hope that they had received and they had not heard that for a very long time. They had to endure it for 70 years, but they knew that after then, they would go back. It was a letter of hope. Today, we honor and we recognize the United Methodist women. If there was ever a body that embodied this letter of Jeremiah, if there was ever a group of people that offer hope to the hopeless, it's the United Methodist Women and all of the ministries that they support. When it seems absolutely hopeless, it's the United Methodist Women for over 150 years that offer a little bit of nothing in the midst of a time when people need it the most, and they don't really know how long they're going to have to suffer. We're going to watch a video just about that. United Methodist Women shall be a community of women whose purpose is to know God, to experience freedom as whole persons through Jesus Christ, to develop a creative, supportive fellowship, to expand concepts of mission through participation in the global ministries of the church. United Methodist Women began in Boston in 1869 by a handful of women who raised funds to send Isabella Thoburn and Dr. Clara Swain to India. As they cared for women, Swain and Thoburn also trained women to be educators and healthcare providers. The effect was exponential. They helped found what would become Clara Swain Hospital and Health Clinic and Isabella Thoburn College for Women. And so launched a 150 year global story that has become the story of millions of women, children, and youth. Their purpose is our purpose. We listened to women in our communities and heard stories of heartbreak and hope. Together, we built neighborhood centers and schools across the U.S., changing whole communities and countless lives. There are 98 of these institutions operating today, whose roots circle back to orphanages, boarding homes for women and children, schools, and shelters. Hundreds of dedicated deaconesses and home missioners serve local communities across the U.S. through their pledge to love, justice, and service. Most U.S. annual conferences in the United Methodist Church have at least one United Methodist Women National Mission Institution. We listened to our international sisters across the Methodist Connection and learned about their cultures, strengths, and challenges. Together, we sent missionaries, equipped women to read the Bible through their own lens, built schools, hospitals, and clinics, and invested in clean water micro-enterprises, and food stability in over 100 countries around the world. We started church-wide initiatives, including the U.S. 2 and church and community workers. We serve in local churches, annual, jurisdictional, and general conferences, as well as on school boards and community, state, and national legislatures. Together, we have been on the front lines of the work of racial justice in the church and in the world. 
gifted the United Methodist Church with the Charter for Racial Justice and worked tirelessly for ordination rights for women. Today, United Methodist Women members are at the forefront of social issues that continue to marginalize women, children, and youth, and are currently engaged in four social campaigns. Just Energy for All, Interrupting the School to Prison Pipeline, Living Wage for All, and Ending Maternal Mortality. United Methodist Women members are stewards of all God has given, giving to the United Methodist Church first, then funding the work further through member dollars given to serve the more urgent needs of others. United Methodist Women is and will be a dynamic community of women in movement with God, experiencing and extending freedom and the opportunity to live as whole persons as we strive to understand and ever expand what it means to be in mission with women, children, and youth. really a lot of good hope for those folks and we feel for them and we understand for them or is there any nugget of truth that we can take and use for today right now in Tremont 2019 here's what I want you to think about how many of you in this room right now can say that you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that's the Lord's name. Okay, if you've just raised your hand, then I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to say, we're all in exile. Would you do it? We're all in exile. If you claim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is not our home. We don't belong here. We're living here. And we really should do all of those things that Jeremiah said in his letter. The biggest thing we should do is to uphold that Abraham covenant, we should influence the culture. We should show other people what Jesus Christ is like. We should show people what it's like to believe in God. Our lives should reflect the God that we proclaim. Amen? Do we do that? Not so much. So before we stop and we think, you know, we really aren't a whole lot, we can't really relate to this story, it's Old Testament stuff. Well, here's a newsflash. It's all one story. The Old Testament points to the New Testament. It's all one story of God continuing to reach out to his people and saying, come back. Whether we're the Israelites or whether we're the Tremonites, okay? We need to come back to God. We need to be the light to the culture instead of having the culture influence us because this is not our home. I've got a Hebrew scripture that I want to look at here. Hebrew 13, 14. For this world is not our permanent home. We're looking to a home yet to come. Well, where is it? Philippians. Our citizenship is where? Heaven. Say it again. Heaven. Where's our citizenship? Heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of familiarity in what we are to do while we wait, just like Jeremiah's letter. But in Jeremiah's letter to those exiled Israelites, he said it's going to be 70 years. We don't know when it's going to be. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. It could be in the next five minutes. Or it could be in the next 500 years. We don't know. So what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Get a little hint from Romans. This is once again the message. 
So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. And embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Keep it there a minute, Marty. Let's say this together. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. When was the last time that you actually embraced what God was doing for you? Most of the time, we're complaining about what God is doing, or we're scratching our heads saying, I don't get it, I'm trying to figure it out. You're not being clear, your voice is not being loud enough, and all I ever hear is wait. And when we do that, we're not embracing the goodness of what God is doing for us because we can't see it because we're blinded by all of the things that we don't see. As we continue with our Romans direction, Romans 12, 2. Don't become so well-adjusted to our culture that you fit into it without ever thinking. What are we supposed to do instead? Fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from what? From the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Let me ask you a question. How well are we being the influence to the culture around us? How well are we embracing what God is doing for us? How well are we offering hope to the hopeless? You see, we can't offer hope to the hopeless until we have hope ourselves. Because we can't give what we ain't got. My challenge to you through Jeremiah's letter. This is my challenge to all of you. Take what Jeremiah says to heart. The words of the Bible are alive and true, whether it's the first word in Genesis or the last word in Revelation. It's alive. The word is alive. And it'll speak to you, and if you allow it to, it will take root in your heart, and it will grow, and you will not be able to shut it up. And that's what we want. We want you to embrace it. So then, you can share. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.